The worst thing in the world is to not be saved, but the second worst thing is to be saved and not enjoy it. Did you hear me? God doesn't want you just to trade some worldly misery for a new misery called Christian misery. Well, I'm talking, doing a series called Pressing In and Pressing On. And to press means to press against your pressure. If you don't have any pressure coming against you, then there's no need to press. There's a lot of different things that we have to press beyond if we want to really enjoy the life that Jesus died to give us. I could probably talk about a hundred different things if I could stay here long enough, but we have four sessions, and so I've chosen some things that I think we all deal with on a pretty regular basis. Today I want to talk to you about pressing beyond guilt and shame. Pressing beyond guilt and shame and learning how to live with a righteousness consciousness rather than a sin consciousness. Learning how to live where you're not constantly, overly, and morbidly aware of all your flaws and your faults and your weaknesses and your failures, but actually grow to the point where you can celebrate some of your victories, some of your successes, and some of your growth. Do you know everybody in here is at a different place in their walk with God? We're at a different place on our journey. Some of you have further to go than others because you haven't been at it as long as others. But the good news is, as long as you're on your way, God counts it as a done deal. Because when He returns in the twinkling of an eye, we shall all be changed, completely transformed into His image. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1. He says, therefore let us go on and get past the elementary stage and the teachings and the doctrines of Christ the Messiah. We don't need to hear a bless me message every week. Advancing steadily toward the completeness and the perfection that belongs to spiritual maturity. Let us not again be laying the foundation of repentance and abandonment of dead works. Now, that's exactly what we're talking about today. He said, let's not keep having to lay this foundation over and over of when you sin, you can repent and then stay away from dead works. You know what the dead works are? Guilt. You know what guilt is? It's our way of trying to pay for what we did wrong. If the transgression has been removed, then how can you remain guilty? See, this is too much freedom for some of you. Because you just think, now, I'm not saying that, you know, we rejoice because we sin. The Bible says to grieve over your sins, to weep and mourn over your sins. But weeping endures for a night, joy comes in the morning. You've got to get in there, deal with it, get over it, and go on. Letting go of what lies behind and pressing on to the things that are ahead. Pressing toward that mark of perfection. I hope somebody in the building is understanding me. And let me tell you something, this is a hard thing to deal with because you can actually become addicted to those guilty feelings. I say this often, but it's the truth. I didn't feel right if I didn't feel wrong. And you know, we can almost begin to get some kind of a religious demon in our brain that wants to make us think that this feeling terrible about ourselves all the time, wretched worm that I am. I mean, do, how would you like it if your kids act like that? I mean, just how would you like it if they act like that? I was doing a teaching one time about, I mean, I'd done it for quite a while about Mephibosheth in the Bible and how David wanted to bless someone that was left of Jonathan's house and Saul's house and so he found his son who was crippled and living out in this muddy hole and you know here the guy was the uh, was the former king's grandson and he could have come up to the palace at any time because of the covenant that David and Jonathan had and said hey I'm Jonathan's son want my rights but no 
because he was crippled, which represents had problems, had weaknesses, had flaws. He stayed out in this little muddy hole called Lodi Bar. Who in the world would want to live in Lodi Bar? I wouldn't. I'd rather live in Heidi Bar or something like that. <laughs> How many would you rather live in Heidi Bar than Lodi Bar? All right. So then it goes on. It's a long story. David said, I'm going to bless you and take care of you. And he ate at the king's table all of his life, even though he was crippled in both of his feet. Great message. You can eat at the king's table, even though you got a few things that are wrong with you still. You can eat at the king's table, but you got to be willing to get up and take your seat. Well, we prepared a Thanksgiving dinner. One time I was in the midst of teaching all these messages, and my kids made this up to do this. And so, you know, you certainly not a good example, but you know, Christ has paid a great price to prepare this wonderful life for us. And you know, I'd worked and worked hard and prepared all the, the stuff, you know, for the dinner, had it all sitting on the dining room table, everything just perfect and beautiful. They're all in there watching TV. And I said, okay, dinner's ready, come on. And they came out and all crawled under the table. Oh, mother, we are so unworthy to eat this meal. <laughs> oh, thou most wonderful, holiest mother, we are just, we just wish that we could be better. We cannot come up and eat this meal because we are not worthy to have this meal that you have prepared. We have been so bad this week. We didn't clean our room. We didn't empty the trash. We watched too much TV. We didn't do our homework. Mother, we are so unworthy. Well, you know what? Even though... I knew that they were playing around with me. It still embarrassed me. And I said, get out from under that table and get up here and eat this meal that I have provided for you. And God is wanting to say to some of you today, get out from under that table, stop crawling around in the dirt, acting like you don't deserve anything. You know, I'm living by a different attitude. God, if you want to give it to anybody, woohoo! here I am. I know I don't deserve it, but if you're giving it away free. <laughs> We've got to get rid of all these dead works. You say, but I feel guilty. Well, here we go. <laughs> but I feel, well, it's time to establish a new beginning. That's what this conference is about. It's about new beginnings, a new way to look at things, a new way to think, a new way to live our lives. Now, I don't have a message that's going to get rid of all the offbeat feelings that you have. But I will tell you this, if you stop giving in to them and feeding them by doing what they tell you to do, they will get weaker and weaker. And in the meantime, you have to learn how to divide soul from spirit, which the Word of God does for you. Hebrews 4, we divide soul and spirit. We begin to know what's God, what's the devil, what's us by knowing the Word of God. So I look at the Word and it says, 1 John 1, 9, if we freely admit that we have sinned, and confess our sins. He is faithful and just, true to his own nature and promises, and will forgive our sins, dismiss our lawlessness, and continuously cleanse us from all unrighteousness, everything not in conformity to his will and purpose, thought, and action. The two verses surrounding that, verse 8 says, if we say we have no sin, we're deceived. Verse 9 says, if we claim we have no sin, we contradict His Word. So, okay, we sin. We do things wrong. That's why we need Jesus. If I could pull this off and never make mistakes, then I wouldn't need a Savior. He continuously intercedes at the right hand of God, I guess because we continuously need it. Otherwise, He would do it every once in a while. I'm going to have fun whether you do or not. <laughs> so, now, am I going to believe my feelings, but I feel guilty? Or am I going to? The Bible says in Revelation 12, 10 and 11, that the accuser of the brethren, talking about Satan, that is his name, the accuser of the brethren. 
And I'll still go through periods of time because that was such a major weakness in my life. That was such an area where Satan had such a stronghold. I felt so bad about me because my father had sexually abused me. And so I felt guilty. I could never keep my father happy no, no matter what I did. So I carried that into my relationship with God. And I got into this. I got to do everything just right. Got to do it right. And I went through all that. You know, if I'm not reading the Bible through every year, and if I'm not this, and if I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, and looking at everybody else and what I thought I should do because that's what they were doing. And all I was, I, I was a mess before salvation. Then I was just a saved mess. <laughs> and I don't, you know. The worst thing in the world is to not be saved, but the second worst thing is to be saved and not enjoy it. Did you hear me? God doesn't want you just to trade some worldly misery for a new misery called Christian misery. Jesus said, I came that you might have and enjoy your life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. How can you enjoy life if you don't even like yourself? Some of you need to make peace with yourself. And it's something that only you can do. God created you and you need to learn to love what he created. That doesn't mean you don't have things wrong with you. We all do. But you got to learn to separate your who from your do. This is the stuff that I found in the word of God that set me free. I would have died from stress, from religious stress, many years ago. Because I loved God, and because of my love for God, I wanted so much to please Him. And I tried so hard to do everything right, and I just kept messing up. I could lay in bed and make my plans for holiness, but the moment I put my feet on the floor, my plan ended. <laughs> and I was like super aware of every little thing that I did wrong. You know what? I, I don't know. I'm sure I've done a few things wrong already this morning, but the good news is, is I don't know what they were. Because if I was aware of it, I asked for forgiveness right away. I received it and I went on. And then I also just say, and, and God, forgive me for all that stuff I don't even know that I did. See, God knows your heart. He knows your heart. And if, if you want to do what's right and you're pressing on, you're doing everything you can to grow, then God sees your heart and he's going to help you get from where you are to where you need to be. But if you don't get rid of the guilt and the shame and the blame, it weakens you and you can't make any progress. Amen? We overcome him by the blood of the lamb. The accuser of the brethren has been cast out. So when he comes around and tells you what you're not, you need to say, I'm none of your business. I belong to another. He purchased me with his own blood from your wicked, evil plan, and I am no longer belonging to you. I am none of your business. the devil's job to tell you what's wrong with you the Holy Spirit will convict you but the devil comes and condemns he accuses God convicts and he lifts you up he tells you you can make it he changes you from glory to glory and he loves you into wholeness how do you overcome him by the blood of the lamb the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. If you were to read Hebrews, you would find a comparison between the old covenant and the new. And the new covenant is so much superior to the old that it can't even be compared. Under the old covenant, people were given laws and rules and regulations to follow. God knowing they couldn't follow them when he gave them. So why did he give them? So people would know they needed a savior. 
And sometimes God will just let you fiddle around with yourself for a long, long time. <laughs> till finally you say, God, I just can't do this. <laughs> like, oh, I didn't know that. God, I have just tried so hard, and if you would just show me what you want me to do. <laughs> what must we do to be working the works of God? This is the work that God requires of you, that you believe on the one. Do you have any idea how it delights God when you just believe what he said more than you believe how you feel? How much longer are you going to let your feelings be the God of your life? Are you going to keep bowing down to how you feel? Or are you going to say, it really doesn't matter how I feel because feelings come and go. They're there when you don't want them. They go away when you do want them. You never know what they're going to do from one day to the next. <laughs> just because you feel guilty, that doesn't mean you are. And just because you feel right about everything, that doesn't mean you are. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of people out there that are just an absolute unbelievable mess. And they don't see anybody's faults. They don't they see everybody's faults but their own. No, just because they feel smug and self-righteous, that doesn't mean that they're right with God. And just because you feel guilty, that doesn't mean that you are. I'm trying to tell you today that if you feel guilty, but you have sincerely repented for your sins, then that feeling that you have is an outright lie from the pit of hell. Because it does not agree with the Word of God. And we're either going to let this be the standard for our life, or we are going to stay miserable. Well, Joyce, how long will it take me to get over feeling this way? I, you know, a while. I don't know. <laughs> a while. Some longer than others. You don't even need to be worrying about that. Well, how long is this going to take and how hard is it going to be? It's not going to be any harder than what you're doing now. <laughs> and at least if we start doing the right thing, we're making some kind of progress. From glory to glory, little by little, he delivers us from our enemies. Don't be so upset about how far you have to go. Be excited about how far you've come. Yeah. My gosh, I've come a long way. Woo, hallelujah. Now, the Bible teaches us that the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. And this is your weapon against the devil. I started to send somebody out this morning to try to buy me a sword, but I thought at 7 a.m. that might be a stretch. <laughs> so I just decided that you could use your holy imagination and see this the way it appears to Satan in the spiritual realm. A two-edged sword. The Word of God is like a two-edged sword dividing soul and spirit. In Ephesians 6, a chapter in the Bible about spiritual warfare, it talks about wielding, using the sword of the Spirit. So, the devil says, you're not, you're not, you're not. And you're either going to agree with him and say, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. And then to make it worse, sometimes then we even go to lunch with somebody and say, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Just agreeing with the devil, everything he says, just agreeing with him. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. But a spiritually mature person will say, let me tell you what I am. You don't need to waste your time anymore telling me what I'm not, because I know what I'm not in the flesh, but I know who I am in the spirit. I know what I'm not in the flesh, but I know what I am in the spirit. And here's what I am. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I am forgiven. I am anointed. I am a child of God. I am forgiven. Amen? I am a joint heir with Christ. I don't get the good stuff because I deserve it. I get it because He deserves it. When King David started asking, is there anybody that I can bless for Jonathan's sake? 
He didn't say, is there anybody left of the house of Saul that I can bless because they deserve it? He said, is there anybody that I can bless for Jonathan's sake? Because he had a covenant with Jonathan. This is in 2 Samuel 9, if you've never read it. And I believe that God is looking around every day saying, is there anybody that I can bless for Jesus' sake? You know, if you bless my kids, you bless me. Woo-hoo. And in case you haven't noticed, Jesus doesn't need anything. So there's no blessing that can be given to him other than God blessing his children. Those whom he died for, those whom he suffered for, those whom he shed his blood for. There's life in the blood. The blood is powerful. You should read a good book on the blood of Christ. You should read a good book on the name of Jesus. We probably don't have it with us, but I wrote a great book years ago called The Word, The Name, and The Blood. You can order it from our office. You need to be refreshed in understanding. This is not regular word. Why do thousands of people gather together in a building to listen to a woman rant and rave at them and scream? <laughs> I mean, why would you do that? Only a lunatic would do that. It's because what I'm saying is not just me saying something. What I'm saying to you is full of life and power. And it changes you. It changes you. We overcome him by the word of our testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. You need to know the power that's in the blood. When the Israelites were to be delivered from the destruction that was about to come on Egypt, they took the blood of a lamb and were instructed to put it on the doorposts of their house. And anybody who was under that blood was saved as the spirit, angel of death passed over. Well, we don't have to get out a bucket and kill an animal now and fill the bucket full of blood and get a mop and mop it all over our houses. Thank God we can apply the blood by faith. By faith. God, forgive me because of the blood of Christ. Cleanse my conscience because of the blood of Christ. Works of the flesh. If you read Hebrews, it says, under the old covenant, the priest had to constantly offer sacrifices for the people's sins and their sins, and yet it never cleansed the conscience of the worshiper. So it was a never-ending thing. We don't live under that old covenant. Let me read you what it says about Christ. Now you guys have gotten me excited. And I promised myself I was going to calm down this weekend. When I get so excited, it makes me tired by the end of the weekend. I keep trying to calm down, but it don't work. <laughs> Hebrews 9, 12 through 15. Okay, in verse 9, it talks about what I just said, that offering those same sacrifices over and over and over never cleanse the conscience of the worshiper. If all you have to offer God when you sin is your guilt, then you're going to be on that treadmill the rest of your life. Verse 12, but he, Christ, went once and for all into the holy of holies of heaven, not by the virtue of the blood of goats and calves by which to make reconciliation between God and man, but his own blood, having found and secured a complete redemption and an everlasting release. If the mere sprinkling of unholy and defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls and with the ashes of a burnt heifer is sufficient for the purification of the body, how much more surely shall the blood of Christ, who by virtue of his eternal spirit his own divine personality, when that blood is offered, how much more surely will it cleanse the conscience of the worshiper? So if you feel condemned and the devil tells you what you're not, you repent, you ask God to forgive you, you agree with God, you thank him for convicting you. You tell the devil, I am none of your business. And if you talk to me, you are wasting your breath. Because every time you tell me what I'm not, I am going to tell you who I am. 
and I am who I am because I have been washed and cleansed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Come on, everybody give a big shout today. Amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah. Are you ready to press past feelings of guilt and shame? If you are, then you have to start believing what God says about you in His Word and stop listening to how you feel. Know who you are in Christ and know that God is ready and willing to forgive you, that He loves you unconditionally. And also remember that guilt is a dead work. All it does is condemn us. God may bring conviction in our life, but when He does, it's to lift us out of a problem not to just press us down and make us feel bad. started to realize just how full the Bible is with uh, mandates that we're supposed to take care of the poor. You know, it talks all the time about visiting those that are in prison and feeding the hungry and you know, taking in the stranger and, and taking care of the widow and the orphan. And so we strive to do that. And as the ministry has grown, our, our ability to influence and do bigger things has also grown. Today, we happen to be in Thailand. And this little boy's name is Somded and he's had some tragic things in his life, but thank God, through your help, he's now living in the children's home here, and his life is looking very bright. His parents both died when he was six in an auto accident, and when they found him to bring him here to the home, he had had severe ear infections, which had caused hearing loss and lots of other problems in his ears. So he's had about two years of medical treatment on his ears, and thank God he can hear fine now, and so thank you for helping us provide homes for some dead and for other little boys and girls like him all around the world. De computerdeskundigen van Joyce Meyer Ministries werken keihard aan onze Nederlandse website. Hey, does anybody need any more coffee? Be right back. Ga naar onze nieuwe site joyce-meyer.nl en volg ons op Facebook. Ben je niet op je mondje gevallen en draag je het hart op je tong? Kost dat jou je vriendschappen? Woorden hebben veel macht. Joyce Meyer heeft een boek geschreven rondom dit thema. Ik met mijn grote mond. Hiermee leer je de juiste dingen uit te spreken of juist jouw mening voor je te houden. Je kunt het boek Ik met mijn grote mond bestellen via onze website joyce meijernl of bel 026 20 22 100.